We have about um, four more minutes. Actually, five more minutes. So just sit tight, listen to my garbage man in the background, and um, I'll see you guys here. And actually, 10 minutes. Sorry about that.
We have about five more minutes, everyone. Um, sorry for the silence out there. Okay, everyone, as uh, we start allowing other people to, st to join in, trickle in and things like that, I'm gonna go ahead and start talking to you guys. And, um, and as they join in, they, I'm sure they won't miss a beat. I'm sorry I'm a little under the weather today, but I'm sure that um, we can get through this class. Today, we're gonna talk about ADA, the basics of it, the codes, and uh, the architectural hardware that surrounds ADA. Um, ADA, if we don't know in the industry already, it's Americans with Disabilities Act. And, and we, we really structure our door hardware around um, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, on how we install hardware, how we uh, set uh, the closing distance, how we set the weights, um, how the pivot points of doors um, are you know, weighted and things like that and also the closing force of openings. So ADA is very important to our industry. And because it's important, um, we have a class here to help you guys understand the basics of it to where you can implement it in your uh, jobs and um, in your hometowns. My name is Justin Vasquez. I work with the JL Jones Group. I, um, I've been working for JL Jones for about two years, but I have about um, 18, 19 years of experience in the industry. But that being said, we still learn something every day. Um, this class today um, is an AIA class. We will get um, continuing education credits. All I require of you guys is to submit that to me, uh, your AIA number. Um, I'll put it down, I'll record it, and we'll make sure that we get you guys credit for, um, for the class. So today's class, what is about, what are we gonna be discussing and what will we learn? Um, in today's course, I have to read this slide because it's AIA. Um, in this course, the fundamentals of what accessibility means to your door hardware specifications will be explored. We'll explore the available technology, the common terminology, and the components and the codes and guidelines pertaining to Americans with Disabilities Act um, we'll discuss all of those. But basically, 
Um, I want to give you guys a general understanding of what ADA means and how we implement it into our uh, everyday lives. As you can see in the photo here, we have a ramp going up to um, an entrance. And what we do is we allow people that can't walk, we allow people that can't talk, we allow people that can't see, we allow them the ability to access an opening and um, as to not discriminate against them from, from free trade, free, free commerce and things like that. So today's objectives at the, at the conclusion of this uh, program, we'll be able to recognize uh, why an owner or a facility operator should comply with ADA, understand the different requirements for compliance, <laughs> for compliance with ICC and ANSI A117.1 and ADA AG, ADA or locally adopted building code requirements, identify what opening components need to be ADA compliant, understand how to specify those items to be in compliance. So anywhere from the door handle that we enter into a space to the push button that um, will open a door automatically for us to the operator itself and the closing force and the opening force uh, by which it opens and closes. Um, different um, areas like Chicago and California that have different rules and requirements as far as closing speed, closing force, pounds of pressure to open and close a door. Um, California is five pounds, Chicago is 8.3 pounds, but we'll explore all of that so we understand um, why it is that we implement those and also understand the struggles of implementing those um, into our daily lives. I didn't mention this earlier, but I've muted all of our microphones. I've also disabled our video. Uh, what I want to be able to do is allow you guys to see me, allow you guys to, um, to hear me uh, without any other distraction. If you have any questions during the class, please feel free to um, type it in the chat and we'll answer those questions as we go along. So why should we comply with ADA? One, we don't want to discriminate against anyone who wants to enter the, um, the building. But um, another main reason for it is we want everyone to be able to be serviced um, in our facilities, whether it be a store or a grocery store or um, anything like that, or even an office building or a university. We want people to be ed educated. We want people to be able to, um, to have free trade um, and we want people to be able to work. So when doing that, we have to allow everyone uh, the same ability to get into the building as you or I would, would have. So the first uh, bullet point here is it enables an owner to meet the needs of all people who occupy or visit their facility, both patrons and employees. So say you have uh, someone who is blind. Well, whenever they walk up to the facility, they're not going to be able to see all the ADA signs and things like that. But whenever they walk into the uh, opening, they start touching around <laughs> and things like that. There will be Braille on each of these signs to where it will indicate to them where they are and how to access that facility. It enables owners to keep their building compliant with current standards pertaining to those with disabilities. It helps an owner to avoid lawsuits brought as a result of failure to comply with ADA. So as we um, as we discussed just a little earlier, when an owner of a facility uh, denies access to someone because they're in a wheelchair, because they're elderly, because they're blind, because they're deaf, whatever their ailment is, if they are disabled and they would like um, to go into a public space, and we do not allow that to happen. Um, that's discrimination against a person with a disability, and what it could cause is a major lawsuit. Uh, now, most of the things that we do in our industry revolve around uh, either a lawsuit or people getting injured, people getting hurt. Um, most of the times, we don't try to comply with, with lawsuits and things like that, but because Americans with Disabilities um, is so important, we want to comply with that and because of lawsuits over the years, um, our industry has changed and reshifted itself to comply with, um, with ADA. What are some common things that we hear as a building owner or a planner, an architect, and things like that? Well, 
here are some of the uh, quick bullets. I can't eat at a restaurant. Um, why? Because the door is too heavy. Well, doors are heavy, but it's up to us as um, distribution partners, as specifiers, as architects to um, recommend and implement openings that will avoid that um, that burden. So if a door is too heavy, maybe we should change it to um, have pivots. Maybe we should change it to have an auto operator or even a power assist um, to where a person who once thought that that door was too heavy it no longer um, is too heavy. I can't see a movie at the theater because there isn't a place for my wheelchair. Well, we'll start to discuss, you know, clear opening widths and things like that. Um, that can and um, hinder or prohibit someone from entering a space. As we know, the clear opening width of a of every ADA opening has to be at least 32 inches of clear space. Now that doesn't mean that if the door is open and there's 32 inches in between, or if the door is just 32 inches, that you meet um, meet or comply with ADA. What what it will mean, and I'll explain this later, is as the door is open at 90 degrees, if you have 32 inches of clear space from the edge of the door to the uh, stomp of the opposite frame. But we'll discuss that later. I can't shop at a store. I can't use that restroom um, because, you know, I have crutches and I'll trip over that threshold. You know, does it meet ADA? Is it a quarter inch rise? Is it a half inch rise with a quarter inch uh, bevel? I can't take that cruise because the cabin is too narrow for my wheelchair. All of these things are different problems that um, we will discuss in detail as we move along through this program. So ADA facts, what you don't know can hurt you. So civil rights law in 1990 by um, George H.W. Bush. Um, it is enforceable by a, class, a civil action lawsuit, which we discussed um, a little bit earlier. So um, here's a little study. Within 27 years, the population of age of 65 or older uh, will increase by 60%, and one in five adults will be 65 years old or older. Now, that's a staggering stat, but what it says is, as we um, as we're aging as a country, as we're maturing, um, we have to be able to allow people to access the same facilities that we that we accessed whenever we were in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. And so all buildings must comply um, or they should comply as they remodel or renovate their facilities and things like that, because we're not getting any younger. We're only getting older and we, you know, we want to be able to access those openings. Businesses have had 13 years to meet the ADA requirements. There's no longer an excuse for violations at this time. So this is the NOD, uh, President Alan Reich. And basically, we've had 13 years to comply, um, which that's no longer true. It's not 2003 any longer. We're in 2021. So we've had ample time to comply with um, ADA and its requirements. And so by now, um, all buildings should uh, conform to ADA. We all should know you know what some of the basics are with ADA. You know, if we're in a restroom, where's our grab bars located? Uh, do we have a 36 inch on you know on our left and on our right, a 42 inch behind us, um, an 18 inch that that rises vertically? Do we have those in our restrooms? Are they in every restroom, or are they in just certain spaces? Um, but we need to understand why it is that um, certain bathrooms have them, why it is certain bathrooms do not have them. When do we have to use them? When do we not have to comply? Being ADA compliant is good business. Over 54 million Americans, that's that's nearly, if we talked about that now, it's higher than that, uh, or all numbers from 2003. Um, I would say 20% 20, 20 of Americans now would be about 60 million people or more. Um, there's been an increase in the number of lawsuits filed on the basis of ADA regulations. Look, I mean, whether it is justified or not, we all have to understand that if there is a spot to where a lawsuit can be uh, put out there, it will get put out there. Not saying it's not justified, just saying that um, if we don't comply, somebody will find a reason um, to make you pay for that. 
non-compliance. An ADA access lawsuit could cost you anywhere from ten to a hundred thousand um, dollars. Settlements are, settlements average about half of that. Good lord! I mean, what business in in our day and age now can um, can take on a lawsuit and potentially lose forty five thousand um, dollars because we're not in compliance? Because we're not spending a hundred dollars to have a angled return lever or certain grab bars or stops in correct places and things like that. So here is some of the um, literature. The first one that you see there is the International Code Council's A117.1 Accessibility Standard. This is um, basically the ADA Bible here, and then the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design. These are going to go anywhere from clear widths of openings to distance of travel between, you know, a door being fully opened and closed, the distance of travel between um, two, two doors in a row, um, clear space around an opening, clear space in a restroom, grab bars, mirrors, viewers. Uh, it's going to talk about everything. Make sure that uh, whatever your local building code requires that we conform to it. So here are some of the ADA categories. Title I, employment, uh, which is one of the most important. Title II, public service. And then public accommodations is Title III. Um, underneath it says essentially owners of certain types of buildings must remove barriers and provide people with disabilities with access equal to or similar to the available, uh, that available to the general public. So anywhere that I can go, um, a blind person, a deaf person, a person in a wheelchair, a person on crutches, um, a person in a walker, they should all be able to go as well. Title IV, telecommunications, and then Title V, miscellaneous. So we're going to dive into the uh, public accommodations portion of it because most of the buildings, most of what we're going to be doing, we're not owners of spaces, we're not employing any, um, any folks or anything like that. We are servicing buildings. Uh, we're putting hardware in buildings and, and designing those things. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Accessible elements and spaces, perimeter access. How do we get to the building? Um, we should have something as far as that meets ADA from our parking to the surfaces on the ground, um, to the ramps um, going you know, over sidewalks and through uh, streets and things like that. And we should have an accessible route to where a person can travel that route and uh, meet the front of the building or the back of the building, wherever that ADA, that ADA access is uh, without any obstruction. How are they able to get into the building? Now, a lot of people, uh, when, it, when thinking ADA, thinking of the front of the building, thinking of a university or something along those lines or a school, they think that um, you should have a button um, a wave to open switch, a push button, um, and an auto operator at the front door. That's not necessarily true. Um, just because an opening is ADA does not does not mean that it has to have an auto operator. But getting into a building, the exterior openings, um, separate interior opening hardware, opening dimensions, threshold surfaces, and then opening forces. Now, if we are in a facility where you know, whenever we open that door, the building acclimation, the wind from the outside, um, you know, the sun, the heat, things like that um, require extra force that doesn't meet ADA, then we might have to add an auto operator so it does comply, but it's not an actual requirement. Accessible elements and spaces, interior access. Moving around the building whether it be by stairs or an elevator. Um, we have different lifts, um, transition strips, thresholds, things like that. Using the building elements uh, from telephones, mirrors, seating, bathrooms, um, things like that. Are our toilets accessible? Handrails, do we have handrails? Do we have fixtures in the facility that um, would allow for ADA compliance? And do our sinks and showers? Do they have, um, are they in compliance? So 
So there are six components that ensure compliance with ADA requirements. And those are latch requirements for an opening. I believe we can only have five eighths of an inch projection. Characteristics of, a, characteristics of a clear opening. What does that look like? What is our door? What does it require to be as far as uh, opening width and things like that? How, how much does it have to open to allow that space? Opening force requirements, different obstacles for a manual door close, closer. Closing speed requirements for a door. The need for an automated opening. If they don't meet um, item four or item three, then we have to move on to item five. Minimum speed requirements for an auto operator. So once we do put that auto operator on, um, what are the minimum speeds? What is the opening force? What are some of the things that we have to comply with once we've done that? So let's look at um, component number one. Levers and U-shaped handles are ADA compliant. As you can see in the photo to the right here, um, this here, this is a curved return, but as you can see, it allows enough space between the rows and the latch for somebody to um, fit their hand inside of um, or use their elbow, use their arm to open that door. As you can see to the right of that, here's a pool that also meets ADA. So the main point here is shall not require tight grasping, a pinch or twisting of the wrist to open. And as you can see in the, the below uh, photo there, having that knob, you have to have a tight grasp on that knob and you also have to move your wrist in order for it to turn. Well, there are arthritis patients and things like that out there that cannot do this. Um, so we want to be able to comply with those patients, uh, with those people. And so what we do is we'll use our arm, we'll use our elbow, we'll use our forearm, we'll use our a closed hand, we'll use an open hand. We won't have to grasp, but it will still open and it'll still conform to the requirements. Some of the non-ADA compliant um, items are going to be right here. Knobs, turn bolts, thumb turns. Now there are thumb turns, that's a little iffy because there are thumb turns out there that now meet ADA requirements. It just depends on the overall length of it. Compliance component number two. Latch requirements and sliding doors. So they must be exposed and usable from both sides when the door is fully open. As you can see in this photo, we have an ADA thumb turn. We have a ADA handle here, and there's gonna be an ADA latch on the inside, or even if it's not lockable, um, we can still open and close this door, which I know it's lockable because of this and this. Um, we can open and close this door from both sides without having to have the tight grasp, the pinching, moving our wrist. We can open that with just our arm or forearm or elbow, um, an open hand, a closed hand, whatever we want to use. This right here is a pocket door latch, a finger latch. So what this would be is on the inside of the opening here, or if you can look at my mouse here, this would be installed here, um, and what, what happens is you have to put your hand in there when the door is fully open and grab it and pull it out. Now, someone with a disability, they cannot do that. So we have to um, remove that. That's not an ADA compliant opening and change it to something along the lines of this here. If you don't want a latch, which this is a latch here, you can just use pulls, but those pulls have to meet the same requirements. ADA compliant door hardware. Now, um, as we talked about earlier, it has to be accessible on both sides. So as you see here, we have ADA flush pulls, which is this one right here, touchless latches, exposed pulls. All of these items meet ADA. Um, touch latches, and U-shaped pools are allowed, they're acceptable, because you're able to put your hand inside those, uh, whether it be a closed hand, an open hand, and you're able to, to use that, you know, use that door um, without having to turn it, grasp it, pinch it to use it. So here is um, one of the most important things 
to me, if you can't allow someone that's in a wheelchair uh, accessibility through an opening, um, they won't be able to use any of the other components, the, you know, like pocket door pulls, like your restrooms and things like that. So let's take a look at this. ADA compliance means 32 inches of clear opening with a door at 90 degrees. Openings with more than 24 inches deep require a 36 inch clear opening. Exception, 20 inch minimum at doors, not requiring full user passage, like a shallow closet. So if, if, if you're not entering that space, you don't have to meet that same requirement. But as it says here, 32 inches of clear width when the door's at 90 degrees, as you can see with the hinge at a 90 degree position, you see the door right here. The door is going to be a minimum of inch and three eighths, more than likely inch and three quarters. So we take three and eighth inch reduction in clear width with a four and a half inch hinge. And how it's calculated, you have a half inch width of the door of the hinge plus the back set, which is quarter inch plus or minus, and then the stop on the opposite side. So from here to here it needs to be 32 inches. It's very important to remember that. Uh, and as you can see here, as this person is traveling through the opening, he has the 36 inch corridor and his clear width at his cased opening in this case is 32 inches minimum. Which is why we more than likely have a um, 36 inch door more than likely on, on openings. At a pair of doors, now here's something that is a little bit different. So if we have a pair of doors, you could say, well, my, my, my doors are six foot wide. Well, you might have a, a four foot leaf and a two foot leaf. The two foot leaf does not comply, but the four foot leaf does. So you have to make sure that whenever you're scheduling those openings, and you, you determine which opening is the ADA opening, um, so that way it meets compliance. One leaf of these openings, however, you can't have two 32-inch doors and things like that because one leaf um, has to meet that 30, 32 inches of clear width, which is going to be this door at 90 degrees, this door at 90 degrees, the hinge back set, and your hinged leaf are all going to be taken into account and it's only with one door closed, right? So if we're at a 32 inch door and a 32 inch door, we're not gonna meet compliance. So what most people do, what most people do, uh, and I'm gonna say a hospital in this example, is they'll have, let's say a five foot opening, they'll do a four foot leaf or a three foot leaf, and then a two foot leaf and a one foot leaf. Or if we have a six foot opening, you can then have two, three foot leaves in that opening. So I'm not going to read every one of these, but it's up here for you to see. Clear opening maneuvering, clearances for manual swinging doors and gates. So basically what it means is if you're at the, on, on the inside of a uh, restroom and a circle, you have to have 60 inches around you, all the way around you. Whenever the door opens to you, you have to be able to maneuver around that. So if it's on the pool side, you have to have 60 inches to maneuver around that. If it's on the push side, it's 52 inches. Excuse me. On the hinge side, again, we have to have 60 inches. On the pull side, 54 inches. So make sure that you are meeting compliance whenever um, addressing gates and doors that are swinging into an opening or out of an opening. And understand that whenever a person approaches that door, they have to have enough clear width to be able to open that door while they're rolling their wheelchair back, um, possibly, they have to have enough space around them to where they can still enter that space um, and, and enter within enough time uh, to get into that opening. Clear opening maneuvering, clearances at sliding and folding doors. So the requirement is a lot less, but there still is a requirement um, for a person to be able to maneuver around. So here's what it looks like. You saw the diagram, but this is what it looks like on paper. Um, so if a person is entering into this space, they're entering in on the push side. So as you can see, 
once they've entered in, whenever the door is closing, they have to have 60 inches right here. Again, this is a push side. So they have 60 inches on this side. And then once they're through the, the opening, they'll, I'm sure they have, this is a hallway or it's a big open area. They'll have 60 inches on that side. This is in a corridor. This is one side is push, one side is pull. So as you can see, as they go into the opening, they have 60 inches of clear width. But entering, once this door closes and this door opens, they again have to have 60 inches of clear width. So ADA accessible hardware. So no projections into the clear opening lower than 34 inches above finished floor. That's going to be for your latch. Projections off the face of the door between 34 and 80 inches shall not exceed four, four inches. So projections off the face of the door, I believe right now they're three and a quarter inches. They cannot exceed four inches. As you can see here, we have a closer. Uh, we have this showing our clear width, um, 80 inch minimum at door floor for the closer and the stops. Um, and then below 34 inches, no projections into the required clear opening. So we're going to get into that whenever we start to look at some surface vertical rods and things like that here in just a moment. Let's take a look at this one. Here's a lot of information here. But basically, um, what we want to look at, the, the big things that we want to see is the visible light. So going into an opening that has a visible light, you have to set it at a maximum of 40 inches above finished floor to the bottom of the light kit to where someone that's in a wheelchair um, can see into the opening prior to them opening the door. And as you can see here, the operable portion right here, this is the latch, and it has to be between 34 and 48 inches. Right here, this is 10 inches above finished floor. And it has to be a 10 inch minimum um, above finished floor of smooth surface. So if we have a kick plate, things like that, that um, we need to meet compliance, um, you have to have a 10 inch minimum of it. Vision lights and viewers. So as we can see here, if we have an ADA opening, you most of the time see this in like hotel rooms, apartments, and things like that, where mm -hmm. We have uh, multiple viewers, and what we have here is someone who is disabled in a wheelchair. They have to be able to see in, you know, see out just like I would be able to see out at 60 inches. So the, the maximum is 43 inches above finished floor. ADA compliant door surfaces. So earlier we talked about 10 inches of smooth surface. Now, I also talked about surface vertical rods. If we have a surface vertical rod that projects down um, into the floor, we have to have something that um, creates a smooth surface around that. In this particular case, you know, we have <clears throat> this kick plate that has this rounded area to keep that smooth surface. There's also companies out there that provide just this portion right here to where it can be applied to the door um, after the fact where it protects not only that that uh, surface vertical rod but it also uh, creates a situation where you have no um, hanging points i guess whenever you're trying to move through that opening um, hanging up on your wheelchair hanging up on a crutch hanging up on your walker and things like that to get around this uh, most companies most distribution partners and most architects will opt to go to a, a less vertical rod so that means that the vertical rod is at the top only there's no bottom rod so a cavity that's created by the kick plate must be capped so this area right here has to be capped if there's a cavity that's created uh, from what we're doing Thresholds. Everyone always wonders about thresholds. What is the true requirement? What is the requirement that we have to meet? Things like that. So as we can see right here, if we have a transition strip, which 
would look like this. There's no angle. The maximum that we are allowed is one quarter of an inch. If we have a threshold, uh, which is going to be a saddle threshold like this one that you see here, or even a transition strip that's a half inch high, um, this angle right here has to be a two to one angle um, that allows this portion here to be one quarter of an inch maximum. The height of this at an ADA opening is one half of an inch maximum. So now let's start talking about the dreaded closing force um, that, we, that we always find in California that creates so many problems. Interior swinging and sliding doors, five pounds or less. I don't know if you guys have one of these. Um, a competitor of ours creates a very nifty tool that shows the closing force. Um, they are very good to have. I would say reach out to that manufacturer's representative to get you one. But basically, as the door closes, you can push this against the door and it'll show you at what force the door is closing. And I don't know if you guys have ever closed the door with five pounds of force or less, but I mean, it is barely, barely any uh, resistance. Exterior doors, some jurisdictions calling for specific forces on exterior, which in California is the most stringent. It's at five pounds. Chicago is a little bit less stringent, but it's still um, pretty stringent, 8.5 pounds. If, the, if we're in a um, fire door situation, there is a minimum, but it's you have to check with local jurisdiction to determine what that minimal requirement is. They might not um, want it to be five, five pounds. They might want it to be 10 pounds. Um, it just depends on what local jurisdiction says. I'd say to reach out to them. But opening a door, closing a door with five pounds of pressure is very hard to accomplish. Because it's so hard to accomplish, what you run into is um, a lot of problems. Five pounds opening force equals three pounds of closing force. What are some of the things that would hurt that process? Well, weather stripping. Just a simple bubble gasket weather stripping could present more opposition to your door than the closer can allow itself to close. Stack pressure from outside, the building acclimation, air conditioning units and things like that. Wind conditions from outside, putting pressure on the um, overall building itself. If your door and frame is out of alignment, if we have a twisted jam or jam that is high on one side, low on the other side, if we have hinge binding because of frame being twisted, um, if we're rubbing the threshold because say we, we wanted our door uh, length to be right above that threshold um, requirement, then we only had a quarter of an inch, but we also had another door bottom or something along those lines, it's gonna cause major problems. Latch bolt alignment. So if our latch is just a little bit off and we are not using a barrier free latch and things like that, um, it's not going to allow itself to close. So all of these things combined, we couldn't, you know, we, we might not have just one of these problems. We might have three of these problems, four of these problems, depending on how good the installation team is working on this uh, project. But three of these problems are going to make it impossible for you to close this door. Uh, with three pounds of closing force. Uh, so let's look at some of the closing speed requirements. Sweep speed or the sweeping period, um, three seconds minimum. So there's not a um, good description here, but oh, here it is. We have a video. Let's check it out. So back check, delayed action, sweep, and then latching speed. So let's take a look at it again. The resistance at which the door opens, the position at which it's closing, the sweep for it to catch up to the person that's walking through the building, and then that um, latching speed. Most people will have a slow sweep, but then they'll have a um, pretty fast latch. And what that is, you know, based around is to get that last go to get that to latch 
um, you'll turn that up a little bit and cause that door to close fast where it'll catch that uh, latch on the opposite side. Um, but again, if we're not installing these closures correctly and things like that, if we're just putting the uh, closure on, we might not even see the latch speed. We might only see, um, you know, you see this all the time in buildings where you go through it and all of a sudden it will stop, it'll go real slow, and then you'll have sweep all the way through past the latch because the closer hasn't been timed properly. Uh, we're, not in a, we're not in an installation class today where we discuss this further, but installation is very important to any building and the success for any building, and it's also important for the success of ADA. ADA compliant closing speed requirements. So, closers from open position, 90 degrees to 12 degrees, you have a five second minimum. So here to here, five seconds. Spring hinges, because they cannot be controlled from here to here, they're not allowed and they're not recommended actually. They are allowed, but they're not recommended. Um, from open position, 70 degrees to closed position. So, here to here 1.5 seconds minimum and then delayed action not a code requirement but may be helpful that's that's what is that that's this to this actually delayed action is from here to here and what that does it just allows the closure to catch itself up and it allows people to get through the opening um, it allows you more time between the open position and then your sweep range your latch range is going to be your last five degrees and there's no requirement on you know when and where how fast this one can close because if a person is still in an opening whenever it's right here there's other problems that uh, we need to address and that will be right here uh, but <clears throat> there's no requirement on this because we want that door to close and latch especially if it's a fire door expectations approaching a building one, the, the biggest expectation is an accessible path to the building, whether it be from a ramp or a lift or something along those lines. Usable access to the building, an accessible path throughout the building, an accessible path in and out of the building. So not only are we trying to reach the ramp going to the front of the building, but navigating through the facility as well, we want to be able to have an accessible path. Accessible handicapped parking must be located on the shortest accessible route to the accessible entrance, how easy would it be? How easy would it be to open the door? Um, whether it be from a easy pull lever with a power assist or an assistance button where you push the button and the door opens for you automatically. It, um, it depends on you and your building. So we talked about this earlier. Are we required by law to use operators? No, we are not. We use them, however, to meet the accessibility requirements when we need additional help or power to close and latch the door. So in a situation where stack pressure, wind outside, um, and things like that, or you know the building is not installed right, it's sagging, um, something along those lines, and we need some additional support, but we have to also meet those other requirements, those other burdens from um, our California Building Code, Sometimes we'll use a power assist. Sometimes we'll use an auto operator to where we achieve that requirement. But when we do, we also have to conform with other requirements as well. So let's look at some of the automatic operators. The one that you see in this photo here is a Dorma ED900. It is a great single opening operator. Um, I'm not just saying that because I represent that company. I'm also saying it because it is a one of the most commonly used auto operators in the industry. Um, it's easy to use, it's low energy, uh, it's plug and play. Most of the requirements um, are preset for you. So 75% um, of the time, maybe even 90% 90, 90 of the time, once you plug it in and you install it into the door, it's gonna already be preset to open and close the way that you're gonna want it to open and close. But some of the different types of automatic operators are low energy. Um, low energy meets ADA compliance. Um, has different controls, which we just discussed. No guardrails or safety requirements. Some of the requirements for it, however, are three seconds to back check, 
full four seconds to fully open. So as somebody's traveling through that space, three seconds to the back check and then four seconds to the fully open position. No more than 15 pounds of force to stop the uh, door movement. Does not require guardrails, safety mats, canceling scanners like a high, high energy operator would. Identify the speed required for an automatic operator. The types of automatic operators that, you know, another type is the high energy. High energy operator, they're a whole lot more com convenient. However, when installing those high energy operators, you're, you must get a certified installer of that unit. Um, there's a hot, whole lot more requirements, but you're able to do a whole lot more with them. Operational description and safety requirements can controls. So with high energy, 1.5 seconds to, to back check and no more than 40 pounds of force to stop the door movement. So it's a whole lot more than the low energy uh, counterpart. This one does require guard brawls, um, safety mats, and canceling scanners, and it also must comply with A15610. When going up to some of these um, openings, whether it be inside the um, vestibule, outside the vestibule, um, you know, the exterior of the building or the interior of the building, uh, we have to understand some of the different components that make up um, and operate that auto operator. If we're in a, a vestibule, as you can see with this one here, we push to open to go this way, or we can push to open to go the opposite way. And at the exteriors, you can see this entire rail was made in a way that you can push it at anywhere. Um, and sometimes you will even see um, some different types of them to where way to open, different touch points and things like that. Um, we're not going to get into the, some of the nifty things like you see up here, the keypad, things like that. But this this is what different balusters look like um, at an exterior of, of an opening. Actuators must be mounted between 36 and 48 inches above finished floor and one to five feet from the door. So just like our latches, um, everything that you're going to be doing is going to be about 36 inches to 40 inches. Most people do about 40 inches to be right in the center of um, compliance. But um, you, I mean, you do whatever you want and your jurisdiction, just make sure that the, at the bare minimum, do not go below 36 inches, do not go above 48 inches. So what's important? Accessibility, public accommodation, meeting the needs of the disabled, building compliance, um, code compliance, law compliance, security, uh, cold access, controlled access, accountability, safety, door and hardware is working properly, proper hardware on each opening. So it's just important to keep in mind that when specifying an opening, especially one that's ADA, uh, take a look at um, your exit devices. You know, we see a crash bar in this one right here, which is not allowed in some jurisdictions. Um, you also see looks like maybe an electric strike on this side, but make sure that your, your um, hardware does meet compliance because the last thing you want to do is build a building. It doesn't meet compliance and you have to rip it all out. What are some of the reasons to comply? You know, without reading all these big things, this, we're talking about our family, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our, and our fathers, our grandparents, um, maybe our nephew that they are trying to navigate their way through life just like we are and we want to be able to equip them with the ability to uh, free trade and commerce just like we would have and so we want to be able to allow them to move through an opening and not discriminate against them just because they have a disability so it looks like we might have some questions here It is, so Jose, um, you'll have to check with your accessibility book, but I believe it is to the center line um, of that device. And so what that will mean is if you're at 36 inches and you're trying to meet the bare minimum, um, you want to be at 36 inches to the center of that opening. But if you are, if you have a visible light, the visible light, uh, which is at 43 inches, that 43 inches is to the bottom of that light. So most people will opt to move that light down 
um, to where they meet within that requirement. And you don't want to go too far down because what you have is um, you'll have a light lock conflict. If it's a fire rated door, um, you have to have a certain amount of distance between cutouts. I believe that's five inches. And so you have to check local jurisdiction. You have to check uh, also with your manufacturer to make sure that where you're placing uh, different things meets the requirements of your opening. You might have to move it from your lock style over a little bit farther and things like that. Well, guys, um, I, I thought that I would finish in about 45 minutes, but just to let you know again, this concludes our AIA, AIA accredited portion of the presentation. Um, I appreciate you guys stopping in and joining me for the program. I will send out this PowerPoint. I will not do it today. Um, feel a little bit under the weather, but tomorrow you will see this um, document. You'll also see a, a copy of the recording. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at the back of this. You'll have my contact information, who I work for, my phone number, and my email address. Um, reach out, uh, give us a, give us some support. Let us know how we can help. If you have any specification opportunities, I say this in every training Tuesday that we do. Um, reach out to me. We're here to help you guys. Ask and ask ask an expert. If I can't answer the question, we have a field of experts uh, within Dormacaba um, that can assist you. If you want, Pete. You can either drop your AIA number in the chat, or you can send me an email and uh, provide me with that AIA number and I'll get you taken care of. But again, I appreciate you guys. Um, and I hope to see you guys next month. So that's something that's very important um, that I didn't even mention. We kind of um, dialed back our offering as far as educational programs and things like that. We were doing three times a week or three times a month, and we've changed that to one time a month. If you guys want to see more trainings, um, if you want to get more involved, um, please reach out. Tell Jonathan that you want to see more of the classes, and um, we're more than happy to do that. Um, I think that um, we need to start up, you know, telling you guys thank you handing out some prizes and that sort of thing. So bug Jonathan, let me know how we can help. Tell me what you want to learn about and um, we'll support that. Thank you guys and see you next time. There it is.